you know, I want to challenge you this morning. You can have all the knowledge about Christian growth and never grow in grace. Do you know that? So if you're not growing in grace, what I mean by that is if you aren't showing the signs, there should be evidence of growing in grace in your life. You need to get on your knees with God and get, get things squared away and start growing in grace. Amen? You ought, to, you ought to look back on your life from one year to the next, maybe not even wait that long. But you ought to be able to look back and say, you know, I now have more understanding. And not just a head full of knowledge, because remember, knowledge without understanding is pretty useless. Understanding is how you apply it, how you put it into use, how, where do you, what you do with it. If I'm not doing more with what I know about God than I did last year, then something's not right. You're, you're stunted in your Christian growth, and that shouldn't be. So I want to encourage all of you, I don't care how old you are or how young you are, you should be growing, you should be changing in your spiritual understanding and in your application of what God has given you. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 at verse 17. <clears throat> you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand. Now, I, I probably should have read the entire passage, but to get the beforehand, you have to start at chapter 3, verse 1. When he talks about the world who says, where is the promise of his coming? Everything has continued the same since the beginning. By the way, that's called, in evolutionary terms, uniformitarianism, which has been completely debunked. All you got to do is go look at some of the Is Genesis History YouTube videos, and you'll, they, they, just, they debunk that almost every video. There have been lots of catastrophes. What's he still crawling around? Yes, he's on. Yes. <laughs> right. right there. Oh, you probably fell down somewhere. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, is that, is that, is that, oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> I stopped it. It's not going anywhere. He just liked you, Gene. There's something likable about you this morning. So, the beforehand, as what, what Peter's talking about here, uh, knowing what, what is beforehand is that <clears throat> there was a cataclysm. Peter mentions all this in, in the first part of chapter 3. There was a cataclysmic flood. And then God promised he would never destroy the earth again by water, but the next time he's going to destroy it by fire. And then Peter says this, It is time for judgment to begin in the household of God. <clears throat> and if it starts with us first, what's going to become of those who do not know God nor the gospel. Bill, because that pretty much what he's saying there. So this is what he, he talks about know beforehand. What, what should we know beforehand? Judgment is coming. And we better be ready. Remember, that's what Jesus constantly behooved his disciples, wasn't it? We just been, last week, Sunday, we talked about the parable of the guy that went on a long journey. Be on the alert. Be on the alert, Jesus says, for you know not the hour that the, that the master's going to return. Be on the alert. Be ready. Amen. Everywhere in the Bible. Back to verse 17. Knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you, will, you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory of now and to the day of eternity. So it's not like you can say, I didn't know. We know this stuff. This has all been given to us in the Scripture. Judgment is coming. You better be ready. Now, 
We talked about various aspects of growth in grace in our first four messages. And the writer of the, in one of them, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, we are not those who shrink back. He's writing, he's trying to say, I know you guys aren't going to shrink back. Right? Big deal. Become stunted in your Christian growth. Go backwards. So we are to be constantly moving ahead, going forward. Going forward. Um, now, many old-time preachers use the term probation. I mentioned it last Sunday. We're gonna, this is the last subject we're going to speak of. They mentioned probation to describe our time on earth. Their rationale was that salvation is not a one-time experience that happened ten years ago. That was the idea. Because it isn't, by the way. That may be where you started your salvation, but Paul says, we are being saved. In another place he says, now is our salvation nearer to us than when we believed. What's that tell you? Well, there's an end, there's a beginning of salvation, and there's also an end of salvation. And you can't say I'm saved until you got to the end we, in, in, in the complete sense of the word. You understand the total sense of the word. We should say more properly, I am being saved. I'm in, the, I'm in the walk with God and I'm relating to Him every day in the hopes that someday I'll, I'll be like Him. That's the, by the way, that is the completion of our salvation is when we're, not, we're morally like Him now, but someday we're as we sang in this hymn of Fanny Crosby's, will be in His brightness. Amen? Amen? Transported. We'll ride. I don't know whether we're going to get our resurrected bodies while our feet are still on the terra firma. Paul seems to imply that somewhere after, as we're going up, we're going to be changed into a resurrected body. Amen? It's kind of like Paul and I were just reading this week in a she, she would ask a question about the parable of the ten, or the story of the ten lepers. Remember the story? Ten lepers came to Jesus, crying out, oh, 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 heal us, heal us, heal us. So what did Jesus say to them? Yeah, he says, go and show yourself to the priest. So in some, you know, in some cases, he would touch them, and they'd be healed. Remember, he spit in one guy's blind eyes. That sounds kind of gross, but that's what he did. And uh, in this case, it says, go show your... He didn't touch them. He just says, go show yourself to the priest. And you, you know what the Bible says? And while they were going, they were cleansed. In other words, they had to do something before they got healed. Amen. Amen. We all want, oh God, you just do it. God says, no. This is cooperative effort. While they were going, they were healed. And one of the men looked down. And maybe his fingers, because you know leprosy will eat your fingers off. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures that it'll eat your nose, your lips, your ears, and your finger. Maybe he held up his hand and he said, my fingers are back. What did he do? He turned around and he he knelt at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And of course, Jesus says, weren't there ten? Where's the other nine? And this guy's even a foreigner. He's not even a Jew. Where's the other? Where's these other guys? Don't be unthankful, friends. Amen. Yes. Make sure you thank God even at the smallest things right. that you have in your life. Amen. Don't take anything. Hey, you know, Joyce and many of the people, they, they follow all these conspiracy theories about shutting down. I mean, they're pro they might be true. I don't know. I'm not making fun of them. I'm just saying. Shutting down food factories all over the United States. Trying to get, ultimately, they're going to starve us all out. It could happen. Amen? Have you seen the ads of companies that are advertising their products and they're saying, get them now because we're 
stopping manufacturing. Oh, well, well, maybe. I don't. I, I, it could be true. Two I just, different companies this week. Yeah. Well, you know what? There's a whole lot of companies in the United States. No. <laughs> you don't realize how many food companies. Just talk to Gene sometime about Del Monte down in Rochelle. He worked there for like 15 years. Didn't you? 15, 10? 20. 20? 27. 27 years. You've been there a long time. I mean, it could be true. But, you know, we got to make sure that we're right with God. That's really, when it comes right down to us, to it, nothing else really matters. You know that? Jesus said that, didn't he? What was it profit a man to gain the whole world, lose his own soul? John was kind of talking this morning about this article he read about all the <coughs> super wealthy people who have these big yachts. And he went, what do they need a $500 million yacht for? I think Jeff Bezos' yacht. We're unhappy. Well, and it never happens. It never satisfies them either. And they, have, they don't have relationships. They don't have exactly. loving people. They need to continue to try to keep right. filling right. this void. And I, I reminded all of them that when Andrew Carnegie died, you know, he was a he was probably the richest man on the earth at the time of his death. He's a very wealthy man. A, law, a journalist went and asked his lawyer, "How much did he leave?" Oh. The lawyer said, "Every last penny." He didn't take anything with him. That's right. You know, remember the Egyptians, they would pack the Pharaoh's tomb with all this food and a boat and books to read. And you know what? They're still there. <laughs> they got in the tombs and everything is still there. Nobody took it out. But they went somewhere. Well, they went to hell. You bet on that. So, salvation is really probation. We could use that term almost interchangeably. God is trying to find out what we're going to do with what He has done for us. Yeah. Amen? You've got to do something with what God has done. That's right. You can't just sit on it. <clears throat> it. It requires a relationship. It's two-way street. Now, uh, <clears throat> The reasoning behind this approach is so God can discover if you are serious about reformation and relationship with Him in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. The writer of the book of, and we'll talk about that in a second, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, therefore, chapter 12, this is Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily besets us or entangles us, and let us run with patience, with endurance, the race that is set before us, <coughs> fixing our eye on Dr. Stanley, <laughs> Chuck Swindle, oh, Swindoll. No, fixing your eye on Jesus, the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I love this about Jesus. Jesus didn't get fixated on the cross. He looked past the cross to the resurrection. Amen. That's how you get through things in life that you don't want to do. You kind of think about the day after that event. And boy, it's a lot easier to get through it. If you, if you don't just focus on that, you think about the, the moment afterwards. And that's what Jesus did. He endured the cross, despising the chance, shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So I'd like to show uh, three points. Number one, what probation is. Number two, the steps in our probationary growth. Number three, the importance of sound doctrine in this probation. And these are all issues we need to be discussing. Now, probation is defined as, this is from Webster's 1828. The reason I like that dictionary is because the climate in the United States was very religious. Now, I, know, I realize it was mostly Calvinistic, or a lot of it was, not all of it, because Finney certainly wasn't Cal Calvinistic in the classical sense. But their vocabulary reflected biblical or religious truth, you understand, much, much more. So today, they've taken all that out of our vocabulary, but not in 1828. Probation? <clears throat> is defined as a moral trial or test, the state of man 
in the present life in which he has the opportunity of proving his character and being qualified for a happier state. Now, by the way, this does away with all this idea that salvation is all of God. You have nothing to do with it. This, this definition itself proves that that cannot be true. Amen? Because you certainly have something to do. <laughs> On the day of Pentecost, Peter told them what to do. Save yourselves from this adulterous generation. Amen? Amen. So, uh, the reason... Now, okay, that, that's good. Now, turn to Romans 5. We'll read verses 1 through 5. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Paul talks about attaining this proven character. Okay? That's what the definition said. The opportunity of proving his character. And the Bible speaks of this. So Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom... Also, we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. We're going to be glorified with God. Do you know that? We're going to be glorified with Jesus. Paul speaks of this very clearly. Several places in his epistles. Verse 3, and not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, or patience. Mm -hmm. And perseverance, proven character. Now the King James says experience. That's okay, proven character and experience, the same thing. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. By the way, who's he given to? Those who obey. Mm -hmm. Read Acts 5.32. You don't just get the Holy Spirit because you pray and ask for it. You have to obey, Peter says. Mm -hmm. So there's a condition to having the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost isn't going to live in anybody who isn't obeying God because to not obey God is sin. And God says, if you're going to live in sin, that's antithetical to me. Mm -hmm. Amen? So, we have to be obeying to have the Holy Spirit. And that's from the Bible. Now, we often get the cart before the horse and talk about hope before proven character. Isn't that true? But there's, a, there's sort of a, a progression that happens here in these verses. These things have to happen. The evidence of our hope is our character proven by tribulations, according to Paul here. Remember I said one of the aspects of Christian growth is persecution. That's what I talked about week before last. <clears throat> now, to those who hold to e eternal security, which is commonly called once saved, mm -hmm. always saved, the doctrine of probation is completely unnecessary. In fact, they'll often say, hey, nothing mm -hmm. that you ever do can stop your being saved. Now, they'll have to admit, well, you know, you might be out of fellowship because of your sin, but it doesn't mean you're uh, out of relationship. So they call it, they separate standing from state. They try to say, your standing is your saved, but your state is your living in sin. Go ahead, Connor, you're dying to say something. Well, they're just, they also say that there's worldly consequences to our sin, but God, Jesus already took care of our eternal salvation. Yeah, yeah. Well, he did. He did take care of the governmental <coughs> problems in pardoning sinners, yes. Mm -hmm. But remember, salvation is a relationship with a person. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. He didn't say, a plan is the way, the truth, and the life. He made it personal. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And we have to come to Him. We have to surrender our lives to Him. We have to do the will of the Father. Just like uh, Hayden's letter from C.S. Lewis. <laughs> we say to the Father, hey, whatever you say, I do. That's, that's salvation. And it has to happen every day. It's a daily walk with God. You have to fellowship with God. And it doesn't... 
You know, some people say, well, I, you know, I don't have time to go into my prayer closet and spend two hours in prayer. Well, if you're busy and got a job, that's in it. But wherever you go, you're communing with God. You're thinking about God. You're fellowshipping with God. I told you stories. I worked at Clinton Electronics for 28 years. We had this big glass oven that I was in charge of. It was, I don't know, 150 feet long. And there was a little a walkway between the back of it and the outside wall. And some days, I'd get so blessed, I knew if I started weeping and shouting at my desk, my employees wouldn't understand. So I'd walk back there behind that oven, and I'd go back, walk back and forth shouting and weeping and praising God. Amen? Hallelujah. And that should, by the way, that should happen many times in your Christian experience. That shouldn't just be a one-time deal. You're robbing yourself if you've only experienced that once in your life. Those ought to be regular occurrences in your Christian life. So Gene come in the other day. He said, oh, I yeah, see you got a cold. I said, no, I've just been weeping and praising the Lord. I've been reading out of the book of Isaiah. I was blowing my nose and I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't know he was going to show up, but I was glad he did. We talked for a long time in fellowship. So, <clears throat> you understand what I'm saying? Salvation <clears throat> is a relationship with the living God. And it has to be living. It can't be a dead, you know... It, can't have a relationship with a dead person. He's got to be alive, and you, you've got to walk with him. So, uh, that's why probation is necessary, because God, now I know, I don't want anybody to get upset, God does not have absolute foreknowledge of your future free will actions, because you haven't made them yet. So God can't know what you haven't chosen yet. He can know what you've chosen in the past, Someone says, well, how do you know Job was going to be faithful? You know, God challenges Satan's heart. How did God know Job wasn't going to crack? Because he, did in the past. Because, he had a lot of because he had a lot of experience with Job in the past. Because he had a lot of experience with Job in the past. Because he had a lot of experience with Job in the past. You got that? He wasn't afraid Job. The, only, the reason that God could say, I don't care what you do to Job, he'll never deny me. Now, folks, you ought to say to God, God, I want to be like Job. Mm -hmm. No matter what happens to me. I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. And the only way God could know what Job was going to do was what he had done. It's interesting because if Satan, who knew, who knew, yes. knew God, yes. if Satan believed in predestination for knowledge, he would Satan never have taken have, the challenge. Yeah, he wouldn't have. He would have just said, well, you see me in the future, you know it, what's the point in me doing anything yeah. about it? You get it? So, absolutely. Why take the challenge? He, listen, Satan was God's number one. He, was in the, he knew more about God at the time he rebelled than any other being. I've actually never thought about that point. Just that, that, yeah, just well, sure. More, more from my arsenal. Right. Why would Satan <laughs> take the challenge if he knew, God knew, what was already knew what was going to happen in the future? Right. He knew the character of God. Yes. He knew he, how yes. God operated. Exactly. And God knew how Job operated. So God had such confidence. Don't, do you understand how important we are to God? God staked his reputation on Job. Do you understand this, what God did? He says, do whatever you want to do to him. He won't crack. I know this man. He's my friend. I want to be that. I intend to be that kind. That's the same reason he could trust Jesus. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, and, and, and by the way, he knew Joseph and Mary. That's why he chose them to raise his son. Don't think that God just went, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Oh, okay, Joseph and Mary, you get to raise Jesus. Oh, no. Believe me, he did a lot of homework to pick these two to be the parents of his son. And yes, the parents of John the Baptist got, huh? They were blameless. Yes, the Bible's very clear about Elizabeth and Zacharias. They were blameless before the Lord. God chose them specifically for their character. So these are big issues, folks. Now, <clears throat> I'm not willing to break fellowship with somebody that says, well, I don't really agree with that. I think God knows uh, the future with absolute certainty. I, I, I don't want to argue about those things. But, see, you can't explain some of these things if you believe the other way. You understand the problems? There's, there's too many problems here if, if you believe that God has knows, knows 
if you're going to belch 10 years from now at 2.08 a.m. in the morning. By the way, what good would that do God if he knew that? Would it serve any purpose for him? None whatsoever. Go ahead. I think one of the most important things is having a right view of God allows you to love him Amen. in the, in the manner in which he needs to be loved. Right. If God is how the Calvinists right. meet him, that God is harder to love and to oh, understand. Yes. Absolutely. So I think it's it is crucial to our relationship yes. with the Savior it to is. know his right. character and what he's hey, about. Why pray? Yeah. If God already knows what's going to happen, mm -hmm. why even pray? If there's not a possibility that God will change his mind. By the way, you know how many times God has said he would change his mind? He could probably name off, first of all, uh, he said at the flood, I, God repented, he changed his mind. I wish I'd never made man. Well, that's the first time. Abraham <clears throat> got him to change his mind about destroying Sodom. I mean, he ultimately had to, but he, he reasoned with God four times and said, if you find 10, if you find 50, will you save it? Yes, I will. Moses got him to change his mind at Mount Sinai. He was going to wipe everybody out and start over. Moses, don't do it, God. And the Bible actually says there, God changed his mind and did not destroy them. The same thing happened at Kadesh Barnea when the ten spies came back. The Bible says God changed his mind. And so there's been a number of times in the Bible where God changed something because somebody, well, I just, in my devotions this morning, I read the story of Hezekiah, 38th chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah goes and says, hey, get your house in order, you're going to die. What's, what's Hezekiah do? He, he turns his face to the wall and says, please God, haven't I been faithful to you? And the Bible says, before Isaiah got out of the courtyard, the word of the Lord came to him. So go back and tell him, I've changed my mind. You're going to get 15 more years. So this idea that God is a fixity, that it's already predetermined and predecided, is just, is just not biblical. You can't prove right. it from the Bible. Well, the verse I always use is Genesis 6. I've yep. even given an analogy with my friends. If God was repentant in his heart yeah. and regretted making man, then he how is, how, why is he repenting and why is he sorrowful about something he already knew he, he and ordained to happen? Ordained it. And he agreed it. I just said, let's, let, I, I, you know, I talked to my friends. I said, let's just take your daughter. You buy her a new bike. And you put the bike and you assemble the bike, but then you unscrew the wheels. Yeah. And all of a sudden you give her the bike and then she falls. Would you be grieved in your heart knowing that you're the one that caused it? Well, if you were a fraud, you might be, but our God is not a fraud. You got that? When he's upset, it's because something happened that he didn't want to happen. And by the way, if God's will is being done on this earth, which if, G if God predestined and predetermined everything that's happening to happen, because that's what Calvinism teaches, you know. He'd be responsible for it. Then Jesus' prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is a fraud. Because if God's will is being done. Why pray that it's done? If he has all these things planned out, knew they're going to happen, and it actually makes them happen, oh yeah, that's what they teach. Well, they even argue among themselves. They can't decide whether the God foreknew it, therefore decreed it, or he decreed it, therefore he foreknew it. But it doesn't matter. It's, it's just sad, though, that this is what's taught. I was sitting down with a man who I'm meeting again on Tuesday who's had horrific things happen to him. And I asked him, I said, do you really believe that this is what God wanted for your life? And he said, yes. And I said, how do you serve a God like that? You can't. I, said, I said, we don't serve the same God. Let right. me tell you about the God I serve. Amen. And the God that loves you. And, and how he created you. Yeah. And his mind's being like just, he's, he's having a hard time with it. Because of even the pastor said, you need professional help. We can't help you. <laughs> That's what the pastor said. Because how is a pastor going to help him? Yeah. Because the same thing that they believe, well, what are you going to say to him? Yeah. And this is why it's actually being a witness to him now, is he's like, I've never heard these things. Of course not. Of course not. I said, you're not going to hear it in church. No. So I'm going to continue to meet with him and continue to hopefully Amen. help that That's right. he continues to... I'll work. never forget the pastor Harvey's daughter went to youth with a mission. And she yeah. called him up and said, oh, I'm learning this, this, and that. He got so angry that he drove to New Jersey from Virginia 
because he said, I'm going to, this isn't right. They're teaching my daughter wrong things. So he said, I, they gave me a cot. I slept on a cot between the books and the library, and I went to hear Gordon Olson teach. And he said, after I heard him for a little while, I thought, well, this answers a lot of questions that I've got. And then he thought, but it also creates a lot of other questions. Yes, it does. That's why we have to be students of the Bible. My grandpa's got to educate people. <clears throat> yes. And the big, the hardest thing, Con, the reason this man's having trouble is you got to unlearn all the garbage mm -hmm. before you get the good stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you've, uh, like <clears throat> some people in this church that drink a Coke every day and eat a bunch of greasy foods. <clears throat> And uh, then they got to detox themselves because they. But then they go right back to eating the coke. And so. I can't lie, John. I enjoy three or four cokes a week too. <laughs> but then he takes a detox to detoxify. So. I don't do that. <laughs> go ahead, John. Uh, you said before many times you start with the wrong premise, you're going to come to the wrong conclusion. One hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Got it. Say it louder so everybody can hear it. The madman reasons rightly from the wrong premise, which means if you have the wrong starting point, like what John said, you will never arrive at the right conclusion. No, ever. My, my wife wanted to have a Bible study with the girls, and they said, well, what are we going to study? I don't know, like, this chapter, this chapter. She goes, no, we need to understand who God is. That's right. And they That's said, the well, I understand who God is. Mm -hmm. I don't need to do a Bible study on that. Brittany spent weeks on it thinking they'd be excited about it, and they work because, they, but Bertie's like, if you don't understand who God is, you're not going to understand anything. Well, this is nothing new. Yeah, I know. Here's Isaiah, <clears throat> chapter thirty. Find this verse because I want to read it right. Here's the people of God. Okay. <clears throat> chapter thirty, verse nine, Isaiah writes, or says, for this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, you must not see visions, and to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Now prophets are preachers. It's like many of the churches today, they tell their preachers, don't preach to us what is right, we don't want to hear that. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. <laughs> like you can sin and still get to heaven. That's an illusion. Yeah. Amen. Where are you at? This is okay. Proverbs thir or Isaiah 30, verse 11. Okay. But listen to this. Here's verse 11. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path of righteousness, of truth. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Now, here's God's people. And they're telling Isaiah, don't talk about God to us anymore. Essentially what your wife's running into. There's a lot of people. You start talking about the real God of the Bible? They're like, they're like who are you to talk about God? How do you know who God is? I know Him. That's how I know exactly. Him. Because I know Him. That's right. Anyway, where was I? Sorry we got so far. No, I'm not sorry we got so far off. That's good. Okay. And by the way, it's always interesting to me that those who follow false ideas are committed usually for personal or professional reasons, not verifiable and practical biblical evidence. And I, I told you this story, but it bears repeating <clears throat> about eternal security. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Defining salvation in an unbiblical way. The Bible Answer Man <clears throat> had a call-in show. And a woman called in and said, I believe in the security of the believers, but what happens if you commit suicide? Now, if he really believed it was true, what would he have told this woman? Of course, the moment you pull the trigger, whatever, you go to be with Jesus. But what did he do? He asked her, why are you contemplating suicide? She said, yes. For the next 45 minutes, he tries to convince this woman not to kill herself. Right? 
proving that he really didn't believe in the security of the believers, that if you killed yourself, you'd go to be with Jesus. Because what is suicide? Well, it's self-murder, isn't it? It's to murder yourself, because you're contemplating it in advance. You're taking your own life. So it violates, thou shalt not kill, which is, of course, to murder. Got it? So it's amazing how these things too. Now, most of us, I shouldn't say this, I hope most of you have read Pilgrim's Progress. Mm -hmm. We watched it on a video with Bill was gracious enough to bring it to church one Sunday, uh, Saturday. We watched it. Excuse me. You know they have that out on uh, children's videos? Like on the animated version oh, yeah. of that? Oh, yeah. Yes. That's what yeah. we watched. Yeah, that's what we watched actually here. Yeah. So I didn't hear it. It was good. Pilgrim's it's an Progress. animated version of Pilgrim's Progress that we watched you hear at the church. Okay, yes. I thought you didn't, come, you didn't come and watch that, did you? We brought, John had the big 60-inch TV we had here for a while. We, we set it up on Saturdays. We played Pilgrim's Progress. So this is one of the classics of the Christian faith. It's a story of the pilgrimage of a man on probation. Got it? If you know the, the story, that's what it's all about. And he's constantly facing all these various issues as he goes through. And they're all tests to see what he's going to do. Got it? Hi, boys. Oh, is it time to quit? Oh, my word. Well, I'd have just kept going if I hadn't seen you guys come in. Yeah. So anyway, the story of Pilgrim's Progress is really a story of probation. What happens during our pilgrimage? And by the way, we are pilgrims. That is, we're strangers, the book of Hebrews says. This isn't our home. It's only temporary for us. We're, our home is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Where, we're, where we're intended to go. So we'll continue on this subject next week. Okay? Father,